a typical broad spectrum antibiotic of the type you may take to, to treat, for example, a urinary tract infection or a sinus infection can remove up to a third of your gut bacteria. And that's no simple matter of just, oh, I'm going to just go take a probiotic and then I'm good. I like to use the analogy. It's like draining out your bathtub completely empty and then pouring in a cup of water and saying, okay, you know, I've, <laughs> I'm good. Hey, friends and listeners of the Switch for Good podcast. Yep, that's you. I have some really exciting news. Dotsie and I have started a Switch for Good podcast Facebook group. We created it so we can build a community of fans that will help us improve the show and deliver on the topics that you want to learn more about. So we want to hear what your favorite content is, what you want more of, and what you want less of. And if you like the length of the show, Dotsie and I are always talking about the length of the show, right, Dotsie? Yes. We want to tailor our show around the needs and desires of our incredible listeners, almost half a million of you. And it's really simple to join. Just go to our Switch for Good Facebook page, that's Switch, the number four, and then Good, and then click on Groups. And there we are, the Switch for Good podcast chat. You can post directly in the group, share ideas, talk to other listeners, and connect with like-minded folks. So go, run, join our Facebook group and tell us what you want. Ever wonder why some people who get exposed to colds or the flu get really ill while others experience mild symptoms or don't get sick at all? Well, fortunately, today's guest is here to provide answers to this mystery. An authority on the microbiome, Dr. Robin Chutkin is here to tell us all about the remarkable flora residing in our intestines and how feeding it the right foods can promote health, prevent disease, and even help us with our weight. Dr. Chutkin is a board certified gastroenterologist at Georgetown Hospital, founder of the Digestive Center for Wellness, and the author of the books, Gut Bliss, The Microbiome Solution, the bloat cure, and her most recent book, The Antiviral Gut. We have a lot of ground to cover today, folks. So if you're a person interested in strengthening your immune system, or you experience digestive troubles, or you're just human, then this episode is definitely for you. Thank you so much, Dr. Chutkin, for being on the show. Oh, it's such a pleasure to be with you too. I always think the best part of the show though is our chit chat before that the audience doesn't get to. So maybe we'll have to do a little, our chit chat, our tech snafus, all of it. That's all the really good juicy stuff. We had a hard time getting on here, folks. It's the first time on Riverside <laughs> FM. So let us know if the sound is better. All three of us had a hard time getting here today, but we're so glad to be here. Here we are. Well, maybe the microbiome can help us with technical issues. I don't know. It seems to do a lot of, of things for us. So tell us first, Dr. Chetkin, what is the microbiome? The microbiome refers to all the organisms that live in and on our bodies. So not just bacteria, parasites, protozoa, which are little one cell organisms, fungal organisms, and of course, viruses too. More than a trillion organisms, in fact, the, the best guess, the best estimate is somewhere around maybe 300 trillion organisms and most of them in our digestive system. So if we were to scrape them all up, although of course they're microscopic, they would weigh about three and a half pounds. And we're talking about more than a billion of my, more than a billion microbes in one drop of fluid in your colon alone. So lots of critters. Wow. So trillions you overall. Trillions, absolutely. This, now, you mentioned viruses, which is new to me, and I know you wrote the book, The Antiviral Gut, so there's probably a lot of information in there about it, but I always thought of it just as bacteria. So what role do viruses play? I always thought we wanted to get rid of viruses. Yeah, you know, it's so interesting. We've all become sort of armchair virologists over the last two and a half years uh, on, unwillingly, but here we are. So we have about... 10 times as many bacteria in our bodies or bacterial cells as human cells. And then we have about 10 times as many viral cells as we have bacterial cells. We have more viruses in our body than there are stars in the universe. And about 10% of our genetic code is actually made up of viral material. Because remember, viruses like measles have been infecting us for thousands of years. So some of that 
viral material gets into our genome, and here's how it gets in. When a virus infects a sperm cell or an egg, it then, remember, viruses aren't really alive on their own. They hijack the cellular machinery of the cell and use it to start replicating and spitting out copies of itself. So when that happens with a uh, reproductive cell, it actually becomes part of our genetic code. So about somewhere about 8 to 10% of our genetic material is derived from viruses. And some of that material is important for really essential functions, like for memory, for placental proteins that are involved with, um, you know, with pregnancy and reproduction. So this is important stuff. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Speaking of our pre-chat, we were talking about that, or you were saying that specifically, we almost always think of the gut as just a, a, a digestive organism, right? To, to digest and deliver the nutrients of our food to all the parts of our body. And we don't think of it as a defensive organism. And that's one of the new concepts that you really introduce in antiviral gut. Why is it important for the gut to be defensive? And I'm guessing it's fighting all of these viruses because we don't have hundreds of viruses at the same time. They're not acting out, let's say. We're not actively sick. So how does this defensive organism work, uh, our gut? There are a couple important pieces to it, and we can go through all of them. But the ones that I want people to remember are the gut immune connection, stomach acid, the gut lining, and gut bacteria, those four. So let's start with the gut immune connection. You know, when I was in medical school 30 years ago, <laughs> over, and I had a fantastic medical education at Columbia, but this whole idea of the immune system, it was a little bit ephemeral. It was like, you know, it's these, these antibodies and killer T cells floating around, but I didn't have a good sense, and I don't think my classmates did either, of where they were. Well, it turns out that somewhere around 70 to 80% of your immune system is physically located in your gut. So where in your gut is it and why is it in such close interaction with this other stuff? So let's get to point number two, the gut membrane. And this is a, this is a concept. I've been a gastroenterologist for 30 years and I, I have to tell you, I did not think about this until about a decade ago. The fact that when you eat food and it's in your gut, it's not actually in your body. It's in this hollow tube that runs from your mouth all the way down to your anus, but it's a hollow tube that is really in constant interaction with the environment. So your GI tract is open to the environment. And in order for it to get inside your body, it has to go through the gut lining, which is a razor thin one cell membrane that separates everything in your gut lumen in the open part of your gut, which is the outside of your body, from everything in the inside of your body, all your innards, your liver and your spleen and your lungs and your kidneys and your immune system. Because on one side of that razor thin lining, we have the trillions of microbes. And on the other side, we have all the different immune cells that are doing their thing, that are making antibodies and remembering the bad actor who got in two years ago and is back again. And now they're like, aha, I remember you from two years ago. That, uh, that acquired immune system is going to remember it. But that interaction between the gut microbes and the immune cells across the gut lining is a hand and glove relationship. And I like to think of the gut microbes as air traffic control for directing the microbes. And I'll give you a really good example of how this works. There is a gut bacteria called Bacteroidetes fragilis, BFRAG for short. And BFRAG is a common gut microbe, and it's involved in doing surveillance. So when it sees a dangerous virus come along, like Ebola or SARS-CoV-2, it literally kicks the lining of the gut. It sends a signal to release something called interferons so-called because they interfere with viruses. Mm -hmm. And then interferons signal other immune cells, and then you get this whole immune cascade designed to fight the virus. And BFRAG does this for viruses that are dangerous. But if it's a harmless virus, it's like, okay, stand down. So you start to see then that if the microbiome is disrupted, if you don't have enough BFRAG or the gut lining is unhealthy, you start to see all these points where things can really break down. So I've told you now, we've talked about the microbiome, the gut lining, the immune system. Number four, stomach acid. Something that people think of as such a nuisance 
one of your most important host defenses. It unravels and denatures viral protein, literally rendering it inactive. And for so many of us, the virus gets in through our digestive tract. We swallow it. So all the people out there who are taking proton pump inhibitors, those acid-blocking drugs that shut down the proton pump, we had a really important study from 2020 that showed that those drugs can make you two to fourfold more susceptible to COVID. Antibiotics too, for the reason you just mentioned, right? They're going to kill off a lot of the healthy bacteria. So, so much of, of creating an antiviral gut, Alexandra and Dotsy, is really about not doing the things to sabotage it, right? It's not about like what's a magic probiotic or supplement. It's about a lot of it looking in your medicine cabinet and saying, am I blocking my stomach acid so it can't protect me? Am I killing off my bacteria with antibiotics? Am I poking holes in my gut lining with non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs? And really being clear on the risk-benefit ratio for some of these pharmaceuticals. Can I just get clear on the role of viruses? Are, vi are some of those viruses also protecting us or are they just, uh, what are they doing? Absolutely. So the same way we have good and bad gut bacteria, and we know that going on a scorched earth mission to destroy all bacteria will actually destroy our health, the same thing with viruses. So some of the viruses, as I mentioned, some of the viruses that are part of our genetic code are involved in creating placental proteins, in encoding memories. We have some viruses that protect us from bubonic plague and all kinds of different things. So again, it's a complex relationship. And we definitely have to move beyond this idea that viruses are bad and understand how do we tolerate them? How do we use them to train our immune system so that we react when we need to, but we're not off destroying viruses and maybe, you know, making our health worse mm -hmm. in the process. Is the gut acid that you were just speaking of, does that have anything to do with the reason people have heartburns and take antacids? Is that it? Well, it, it does, but it's not the acid itself. It's the acid being in the wrong place. So stomach acid is, relieved, is released from the stomach, and its purpose is to help digest the food. What, there is a valve called the lower esophageal sphincter that's a valve between the esophagus and the stomach. So you eat the food, it comes down the esophagus, it enters the stomach. After it gets into the stomach, that valve shuts pretty tight. And the reason that so many people have heartburn, acid reflux, GERD, isn't because they overproduce acid. Overproduction of acid is a rare condition that very few people have. It's because that valve opens inappropriately and allows the acid to come up into the esophagus where it's not supposed to be. The acid's supposed to be in the stomach digesting food. So it really is that inappropriate opening of the valve that causes symptoms. And what causes a valve to open inappropriately? Overfilling our stomachs, eating too much food, eating a high fat diet, like lots of dairy, because that slows down the emptying of the stomach, causes a valve to open alcohol, chocolate, caffeine, you know, all the fun stuff, eating too late at night. Mm -hmm. That also does it because our stomach has a bedtime. It's not very active in terms of contractility once the sun sets. So all of these factors, which are primarily diet and lifestyle factors, mm -hmm. can conspire to cause reflux. Now, some people have a valve that doesn't close as well, but again, that's rare. For most of us, it's we're eating too much, too late, wrong foods. Mm. You said that dairy slows down digestion and some other, how, what are the mechanisms of that? How does dairy, it like that? Yeah. Down? Dairy is a high fat food. And in fact, in the U S it is a major contributor to fat in the diet because people don't perceive it. You know, when people are eating a porterhouse, they're like, okay, I'm eating red meat. I've got to be aware of my heart health, et cetera. But so many people think dairy is a health food. And so they're eating yogurt in the morning and they're eating cheese at lunch and they're having ice cream or some sort of cream sauce and at night. Because they think low fat dairy is fine. Exactly. The dietary guidelines tell us that. So yes. a lot of people are doing that. So, they, so why are they not in the clear? So the problem is that dairy, by definition, is a high-fat, high-sugar food. Dairy is what gets a little bitty calf to grow to a very big cow very quickly. And any food that is high-fat, so I would include the porterhouse steak in this category, as well as the dairy, including the low-fat dairy, all of those foods basically slow down the emptying of the stomach because fat is a much more complex food for the body to digest. 
So when there's a lot of fat in the stomach, it means that the contractility slows down even more so that the stomach has a chance to break down the fat. And that leads to things sitting in the stomach and eventually having an opportunity to come back up, to reflux back up. Wow. Okay. To go back to the microbiome, um, I know this is the gut is, by the way, from the what, from the, the esophagus down to the anus? Is that the gut? It's really the mouth, that? Alexandra. It's oh, the right. mouth. You know, digestion really starts a salivary amylase and lipase. I mean, the air, nose, and throat docs claim the mouth, um, but there's a little overlap. So it is, I mean, I, you wouldn't come see me if you were having a dental problem, but <laughs> technically speaking, the mouth is part of the digestive tract too, all the way down to the anus. Yeah. Okay, good. So, I remember the first time I heard about the microbiome, it was not too long ago, maybe six, seven years ago. And I was blown away because what they were talking about was the fact that um, when babies were born vaginally, they were, they had a whole different set of health um, promoting bacteria in them than if babies were born from C-section. Can you talk about when the microbiome is first formed and what we've uh, done to screw that up and what we can do to make that better. Yeah, that is exactly right, Alexandra. So mm -hmm. if you've ever been at a live birth, uh, many of us don't remember when we gave birth because we were busy trying to get the baby out <laughs> Like not be in pain. But if you've watched a video or an animation or you've been at a birth, what you'll see for a vaginal birth is that as a baby's head crowns, it turns posteriorly to face the tush. And it does that to swallow a mouthful of microbes because that area between the vaginal opening and the anus, that area we call the perineum, is full of microbes. It is one of the most microbially rich parts of the body. So as a baby's coming out, it swallows a mouthful of the mother's microbes, and those important microbes become the founding species for the baby's microbiome. Now, babies that are born vaginally have that benefit. Babies that are born via C-section don't get that opportunity, and as a result, they are colonized with hospital-acquired Staphylococcus aureus, instead of the mother's healthy bifidobacterium, et cetera. And what that means is that those babies born via C-section have higher rates for four things, for asthma, for autoimmune diseases, for allergies, and for childhood obesity. Just because of that difference with the hospital-acquired staff versus the mother's microbes. So these are important differences. And you know, while some C-sections are done for really important reasons, sometimes to save the mother's life, to save the baby's life, we know that somewhere between one in three and one in four births in the U.S. are done by C-section. And we know that a pretty significant number of those are done for convenience and for commerce, and not because that is really what needs to be done. So, you know, what day, what time, you can control it, but you know, my argument is a process that takes nine plus months should not be rushed. It takes that long for a reason. And the baby lets you know when it's ready to come out. But in my second book, The Microbiome Solution, I wrote a whole birth plan about, you know, how to prepare the microbiome before conception. These are the things to talk to your team about vaginal delivery, not sterilizing the baby when the baby comes out, all of these things. And my OBGYN friends, hated me. They were like, all these women are coming in and they want to do everything natural and it's the biggest pain in the neck. And why did you write this? But I wish I had had that plan when I was pregnant 17 and a half years ago when my daughter was born. It was a C-section. She got antibiotics at birth. She was minimally breastfed because my breast milk dried up from all the antibiotics I had been given. I mean, it was a disaster. And nobody told me, and I don't think nobody knew. I don't think any one of those physicians, including myself, had any clue about the long-term effects of what was going on. So mm -hmm. I think, you know, we all have an obligation to educate each other and to bring the information to the forefront so that people can use it. And, you know, if you have to have a C-section, so be it. But if it's just being presented to you as an elective option, you need to know that there are consequences, particularly if you're somebody who has an autoimmune disease or has a history of an autoimmune disease in your family. What are some of those thoughts and tips for mothers that are listening to this that are going to give birth in a couple of months? What sure. should they consider? 
Well, the first thing to know is that make sure that the C-section is necessary and it's not an elective C-section, okay? So you're having a C-section because a baby's breech or the baby's in distress, et cetera. Number one. Number two- Let me interrupt you one second because sure. I've got a personal, know somebody personally that is electing um, to have the C-section because of an autoimmune that they have. Well, the C-section, the babies born by C-section have an increased risk of autoimmune disease. Right, now, right. if, if she has an autoimmune disease like Crohn's disease, where sometimes there are, um, there can be fistulas, rectovaginal fistulas, there can be things going on in the rectal and vaginal area that could lead to a tear or a problem sometimes they need to do a C-section for that reason. So it may, there may be more technical reasons there, but just having Crohn's does not equal a C-section. And in fact, sh should we try and avoid a C-section in that case because of the potential increased risk to the baby? So it's important to make sure that this C-section is truly medically indicated, number one. Because the hospital- Number two- It makes more money, the hospital, if it gets a C-section. The hospital makes more money, the doctor that. makes more money. Right. Sure. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. And remember, C-section is surgery. So you have potential complications like infection, blood clots, bleeding, death. I mean, it's rare, but you know, you don't want to have surgery if you don't have to. The second thing is about antibiotics to, you know, when you go in, you sign a general consent for care and that can, so that they don't have to come, oh, can we do this? Can we do that? I mean, you're in labor, right? You're, this is not the time for 20 questions, but you need to make it clear that you don't want to be given antibiotics during labor, which are going to go through the placenta and often get to your baby unless they're absolutely necessary. So no prophylactic antibiotics. If you have an infection or the baby has an infection, so you wanna be clear about that. You wanna understand the risk of labor-inducing drugs. And you know, again, full disclosure here, I'm just a lowly gastroenterologist. I am not a gynecologist or an obstetrician. So these are my perspectives as a gastroenterologist. You, Everybody needs to talk to their own doctor about this. But labor-inducing drugs, that help to speed up labor are often associated with an increased likelihood of C-section. And that's what happened with me. And now it may be that they need to speed up labor because it's taking too long, the baby's in distress or whatever. But if it's taking too long, then people just need to be patient. If it's taking too long and the baby's in distress, that's different. But often, you know, I went in at, I don't know, it was like two o'clock and at midnight, the baby was not there yet. And people start to get, you know, a little like, okay, it's, you know, it's time, but it's time when the baby's ready, you know? And so that's the thing, like these labor inducing drugs can sometimes increase the risk of C-section. The epidural, which I was so grateful to get. And the funny story, I had my baby at Georgetown. I was on faculty there and um, the medical student came in to sort of prep my back for the epidural. And then one of the attendings, one of the supervising physicians, who I knew well because I worked with him in endoscopy. In fact, I think I had done his colonoscopy. He came in and he was like, no, 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 get out of the way. Like VIP patient, she's a faculty member here. I'm going to do it. The funny thing is at that point, if one of the hospital janitors had walked in and said, I'm going to do your epidural, I would have been like, great, have at it. Because I was in some serious pain, you know, like, Labor pain varies when people tell me, oh, it was all natural. I'm like, you know, it was fine. I mean, I was in serious pain and nobody had ever told me. And again, I trained at good places. Nobody had ever told me in medical school or afterwards that that epidural that is going to dramatically alleviate the pain is also going to increase your likelihood of a C-section. And, you know, had I known that, because I really wanted to avoid a C-section, had I known that, I made, I might have made a different choice. I mean, it was painful. Don't get me wrong, but I, I likely would have made a different choice. And so again, what we want is we want people to be able to be really effective advocates for their health. And without the information, you really can't advocate, right? You just assume that this is all going down because it needs to, and it's, you know, all a great idea. And, you know, again, even for me as a gastroenterologist, gone to Columbia Medical School, did my GI fellowship at Mount Sinai, chief resident, I knew none of this. 
Now, I also heard in this in this original story that I heard about the microbiome that you can swab the vagina uh, if there is a C-section and then swab the baby with the vaginal uh, excretion so that the baby gets the, the microbiome. Is that something that you recommend yeah, that, that somebody yeah. asks for? Well, this is something called vaginal seeding. And um, Gloria Domingo Bellez, I think I'm getting her name right. Her husband, Marty Blazer, was the head of infectious diseases at NYU, and they've both done a lot of great work in the microbiome. She's done a lot of this work in South and Central America, looking at this process mm -hmm. of vaginal seeding. And it's super low tech. You literally take a piece of gauze and, you know, it doesn't even need to be sterile gauze because the whole point is to get it kind of dirty. And you, exactly what you said, Alexandra, you know, you put it in the vaginal secretions down in that sort of perineal area and then wipe the baby's head, mouth, et cetera, to sort of approximate a vaginal birth. And I talk about that in my birth plan, but I also say, be sure to discuss this ahead of time, not when you're in labor, ahead of time at your prenatal visit. Because if you start doing this, they might call security on you. You know, they're busy sterilizing the baby <laughs> and wiping off, you know, that's also something I talk about in the birth plan. Like don't take that physoderm, hexaderm, whatever it is, and wipe off all the microbes. That's, you know, you want that. So it's important if you are gonna do vaginal seeding, that the team is aware, and we have some good data for it. There are a few studies that suggest that it may not be helpful. Um, you have to be aware of, you know, what's going on vaginally and make sure that, you know, you're doing it correctly. But it's a super low-tech procedure. It literally costs you the pennies that the vaginal gauze, that the, um, the piece of gauze cost. And it can be really, really helpful for, particularly for somebody who's having a C-section, who is concerned about these risk factors, uh, asthma, autoimmune disease, allergies, obesity, et cetera, for their kid. Let's say they have a personal history. Let's say your friend, Dotsie, who has an autoimmune disease and has been told she needs to do a C-section, that might be yeah. something really appropriate for her to discuss with her, her care team. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for that. That is very, this is very specifically for her. So, sure. <laughs> tune in. Can we go back to fat uh, for a moment? I, I have had this explained to me before, but I always want to hear it again, and especially for our audience. How fat plays a role in leaky gut, leaky gut and seeping through the tight junctions and why it's mostly fat foods uh, foods that are fatty uh, that promote or or give us leaky gut. Yeah, you know there are there are a number of things that can cause an increase in intestinal permeability, which is what we're talking about. And I always like to remind people that leaky gut or increased intestinal permeability isn't a disease in and of itself. It's a mechanism. It's basically saying that fishing net that is your gut lining that's supposed to be a selective net that allows certain things through and prevents certain things from, you know, blocks other things, that the holes have gotten big and now it's lost its selectivity. And so now what can happen, viruses, bacteria, poorly digested food particles, et cetera, toxins in the environment can get through. And there are a long list of things that contribute to leaky gut. So not, you know, I always like to start with the medicine cabinet, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, ibuprofen, aspirin-containing drugs, they are high on the list for increasing the holes. That's what I see when I do an endoscopy in the hospital and I see an ulcer. That's what that is. It's a big hole. But there are microscopic versions of that that those drugs can create. Alcohol can do it, stress, radiation, high-fat diet, ultra-processed foods with a lot of emulsifiers, etc certain types of infection. So there are lots of different things that can sort of, you know, wear down your gut lining in that sense that can do it. And, um, you know, for a lot of the ultra processed foods, it is really the, the emulsifiers and things in it, things like carrageenan and the soy lecithin and the guar gums and so on that we think are, are doing some damage both to our gut bacteria and the lining. So it's really the sum total of all of these things. Yeah. In your bio, you say that you're passionate about more dirt, sweat, and vegetables, getting those into people's lives. And I know you deal with that in your books. Can you explain to us what those three things, dirt, sweat, and vegetables, how they have to do with the gut and why they're good? 
Sure. You know, I was reading last year um, James Clare's fantastic book, Atomic Habits. I don't know if you guys have read it or have had him on and was thinking about that and thinking about, you know, he really focuses on doing these things consistently. And I was thinking about my ride or die. What are the things that really kind of sustain me and keep me healthy physically, emotionally, mentally? And it really has been this dark sweat veg. So get outside in nature, Mm -hmm. get sweaty and eat some vegetables. And, you know, this morning it was a twofer because I went running outside in the trail and uh, I came back and had my green smoothie. I was like, done, dark sweat veg, (laughs) all, all done. And I don't get super prescriptive or specific about the dirt. Like, does it have to be outside in Rock Creek Park? Could it just be in my neighborhood? It's fine. Get outside. Um, Same thing for the sweat. You know, am I running? Am I at my favorite yoga spot, Down Dog Yoga? Am I at a CrossFit class? Doesn't matter. Get, you know, move the body. And the same for vegetables. Blend them, saute them, broil, boil, you know, get some in. And we have really clear and compelling data for some of these interventions. Of course, I, you know, there's more that you can do in terms of health, but for me, these three are really essential. So for example, we have data from over a hundred years ago from the Spanish flu epidemic that the, in the military soldiers who recuperated outside in the fresh air had a lower mortality in one study, 40% inside the hospital, 13% outside. And that's because of something called the open air factor, which is described as a germicidal constituent in the air. You know, it's literally, we don't even know what it is, but we know that it can kill pathogens. So not only does being outside reduce transmissibility, you know, we saw during the throes of the pandemic, outdoor events. So not only are you less likely to become infected outside, But if you are infected, your recovery can be enhanced by being outside. During the pandemic, at least in Los Angeles, the houseless were, they thought that it would devastate the houseless community, but it didn't because they think because they were outside. That is so interesting. We've seen that in other parts of the world too. We've seen that in refugee camps in parts of Southeast Asia and so on, where Mm -hmm. People, same thing, like COVID ripped through and very, very low mortality. So um, very interesting that you saw that in Los Angeles. Yeah. So the outdoor air factor. So that's the, you know, dirt. We know that exposure to soil microbes, other than that initial passage through our mother's birth canal, those of us who were fortunate enough to make that prophetic journey and getting the microbes from food grown in soil, soil microbes are a huge contributor to the health of our microbiome. And we know that so many of us are spending all our time indoors. So if we live in cities, we're already at a disadvantage because as the glass and concrete increases, the amount of these healthy microbes typically decrease. We know from the Japanese, this habit of shinrin-yoku, forest bathing, is incredibly beneficial for lowering blood pressure, for improving mood, for improving feelings of well-being, for wound healing, and it turns out for recovering from viruses. So the dirt part is really clear. The sweat, we know that exercise is the most potent non-pharmacological intervention for our immune system. And regardless of whether we're losing weight or what we're doing, exercise is, I'm going to say it again, the most potent non-pharmacological intervention for our immune system. So I think that that says it all right there. And then vegetables. We have data from the American Gut Project study in 2018, great nonprofit that studies the microbiome. And their 2018 study showed that regardless of what you call yourself, regardless of whether you're a vegan, a pescatarian, a lactovarian, vegetarian, carnivore, flexitarian, 30 or more different plant foods per week was associated with a healthier, more diverse, more robust microbiome. And 10 or fewer plant foods per week was associated with a much less healthy microbiome. So um, I'm a big fan of Michael Pollan's book, In Defense of Food. And you guys remember he has a, he has a, the original version of the book. He has a bunch of lettuce on the cover and the band going around it. And it says, eat food, not too much, mostly plants. And that kind of sums up the whole book. Well, I would, I would condense it down to eat more vegetables. 
And I think, you know, even for some of my vegan patients who are eating a lot of shortcut foods or eating a lot of um, sort of, you know, the animal replacement foods that are filled with a lot of ingredients, they're eating a lot of quick foods. There's not necessarily a lot of cooking going on. And sometimes they're not eating a lot of plants. So sometimes even for my vegan patients, I have to remind them that that magic number of 30 is going to really get you to the finish line in terms of a healthier microbiome. We know that when healthy gut bacteria ferment plant fiber, they break it down to something called short-chain fatty acids. And these short-chain fatty acids like butyric acid, propionic acid, are essential to maintaining a healthy gut lining and to guiding the immune system to that just right response where it's active enough to clear the virus, but not so active that now it's destroying normal tissue and you're ending up with respiratory distress, et cetera. So, you know, sometimes I, I have to really try hard to make it more complex and scientific and somehow sexier than eat more vegetables, but eat more vegetables is really good medical advice. And that's because the bacteria feeds on these vegetables and the, exactly. good, bac the good bacteria uh, uh, flourishes and we have more balance in our gut. Is that exactly. correct? Exactly. Yep, yes. that's so exactly fiber, right. Is it, is it all down to fiber? Fiber. <laughs> fiber, yeah. So it's vegetables, but it's also what we call microbiota accessible carbohydrates, MAC. So not like the makeup MAC, but uh, like the microbes MAC. And so that includes, you know, all those vegetables, the leafy greens, the hard vegetables like garlic, leeks, onion, that stuff is great. The legumes, lentils, other beans, whole grains, brown rice, oats, all of it. So it's really the full gamut. And how long does it take for the microbiome to change once someone decides, I'm going to change, for example, my diet, or I'm going to stop using this antiseptic, or I've just done a run of antibiotics. And then, I mean, I don't know, maybe, maybe one, one I'm sure is antibiotics probably is much harsher than maybe a, a hamburger. I don't know. But uh, can you explain a little bit about what we can do to get a good microbiome? How, how fast does it, does it change? Sure. And you're absolutely right. Antibiotics are going to be a lot more deleterious than a cheeseburger. A typical broad spectrum antibiotic of the type you may take to, to treat, for example, a urinary tract infection or a sinus infection can remove up to a third of your gut bacteria. And that's no simple matter of just, oh, I'm going to just go take a probiotic and then I'm good. I like to use the analogy. It's like draining out your bathtub completely empty and then pouring in a cup of water and saying, okay, you know, I've, I'm good. So they're really, antibiotics are designed to kill bacteria. That's what they do. That's their only job. And so you are always going to take a hit from taking an antibiotic. But if you have not taken a lot of antibiotics in the past or a lot of other microbiome disrupting drugs like acid blockers, steroids, et cetera, if you eat a healthy diet, if you've you know, had good exposure to nature, et cetera, you might be okay with a course of antibiotics. Somebody on the other hand, who's been on antibiotics for prolonged periods of time, maybe doesn't eat a great diet, et cetera. So it really depends on what your overall terrain looks like. But, um, so antibiotics can be tricky because, you know, it's cumulative and it never completely goes back to what it was. In terms of diet, we have a great study that was published in the journal Nature, in 2014. And that study looked at nine volunteers and they put them on an Atkins type pork rinds prosciutto diet. I kid you not, pork rinds for snack. Mm -hmm. They put them on that diet and they looked at the microbiome before, during, and after. And then they rested those same nine volunteers for about five days and they put them on a plant-based diet. Jasmine rice, lentils, I believe it was mango for snack instead of the pork rinds. And what they found is that not only did the microbes change dramatically within about 30 hours, so somewhere around a day and a half, but they saw different genes turned on and off too as a result of the dietary changes. So some of the microbial changes we can see when we start to eat more fiber and more plants is that the bilophilia, the bile-loving bacteria will drop. And those are the bacteria that are involved in breaking down meat products. And unfortunately, some of them are also associated with inflammation, diarrheal disease, et cetera. And then we'll see bacteria like Fecalobacterium prosnitzii, that's one of the good guys, that helps to ferment that plant fiber and produce a healthy short-chain fatty acids. Those levels will rise. And again, that's about a day and a half. 
So, I mean, it's so mm-hmm. optimistic, right? It's not like, okay, I got this bad genetic hand and I, you know, have all this disease in my family. Like we know the genes are just a suggestion. They're not what determines ultimately disease expression. It's these epigenetic factors like our diet, our environment, et cetera. And we have a great deal of control over it. So to me, to be able to tell somebody that, you know, in 30 hours, you can be on your way to improving your microbiome is, I mean, it's incredible. Mm. Will we ever get to a point where we create like um, intelligent medicine, uh, intelligent antibiotics that are we're able to take and they are able to target only the bad bacteria and not the good bacteria? I don't think so. No, <laughs> I, I, I don't, Stop no. That dream. Okay. I don't because... It is, you know, there are, first of all, there are as yet hundreds, if not thousands of undiscovered species. Mm. So, and, you know, different strains and so on. So, and there's so much crossover and it's not just the bacteria itself. It's also what we call the postbiotic, the metabolite. It's what the bacteria is actually making Mm -hmm. and that can switch. And Dossie, I guess the best example I would give is to say, Everybody who is a good person, raise your left hand. Mm. Everybody who is sometimes a bad person, raise your right hand. <laughs> you know, so it's like saying we're going to kill all the good, all the bad people in the population. Uh, I mean, there are some people in the population who clearly, right. you know, <laughs> <a few>. <laughs> maybe <laughs> they don't deserve to be here. Right? They are wreaking havoc. I won't name names, <laughs> right. but there, you know. And then there are other people who are literally, you know, deserve sainthood. But most of us are somewhere in the middle, right? We're like, and bacteria are kind of like that too. So a lot of what, a lot of what we're dealing with is this concept of pathobionts rather than pathogens. So a pathogen, like Ebola is a pathogen. There's nothing good about Ebola. You know, you do not want, or, you know, methicillin resistant staph aureus, flesh eating bacteria. These are bad dudes. But symbionts are bacteria that live very peacefully with us and sometimes even contribute to our health. So what we're seeing a lot of the time, it's not that we are invaded by pathogens. It is that there is imbalance, disruption. So think of a yeast infection, a vaginal yeast infection. You take one too many antibiotics, all of a sudden you've got a creamy white discharge, you're itching, you have a yeast infection. Yeast are not the bad guys here. We have candida in our body. It is an essential part of digestion. Candida are part of the normal flora in the vaginal microbiome. But what happens is when you kill off a lot of the healthy vaginal lactobacillus with the antibiotics, now the candida start to overgrow. And now you have a problem. But if you approach this as, okay, I'm going to go on a scorched earth mission to destroy every yeast in the body, you're not going to end up at a very good place because you're missing the main problem, which is the main problem is you're missing the healthy microbes. You've killed off too many of those. Mm -hmm. So the focus really, we we really need to focus on repopulation and not repopulation with a store-bought probiotic, repopulation with our own innate gut bacteria by feeding them differently. And I think, you know, Dotsie, to sort of give you a roundabout answer to your question, I don't think, I mean, we have more narrow spectrum antibiotics. Penicillin is going to be a better choice than like a cephalosporin that's more broad spectrum. Mm. But the problem is because of increasing antibiotic resistance, because we have so overused these antibiotics, and remember 80% of them are used in the food industry primarily to feed animals. We have such wide spec, wide resistance to these, with these resistant superbugs, our antibiotics increasingly each year are more and more potent. So we're kind of moving in the opposite direction where they're, you know, they're killing off everything because there's so much resistance. But here's where I think we may be moving, which is could we take bacteria in our gut, take them out, and then somehow like really replicate and magnify them and then put them back in? our own gut bacteria in some way. And of course, one way to do that is to just eat more plant fiber. But of course, nobody wants to do that. (laughs) Everybody wants the high tech, right? Nobody's like, oh, you could have a green smoothie, have a salad for lunch, eat some rice and beans. No, no, I want to go buy 
the product and take it and have it do that. So no matter, I mean, even if you borrowed a bunch of Fecalobacterium prosnitzii from your plant eating friend, and I injected it up into your colon, if you are then feeding them Cheetos and cheeseburgers, you're not going to get meaningful. You can't get away from the food. You can't get away from the fact that to have a healthy population there, you absolutely have to feed them the right food. So that's where the consistency comes from that you talked about from James Clear's book. Absolutely. Yeah. And it doesn't have to be a lot, you know, just a little bit. Like I, I have a little rule with my patients. I call it the one, two, three rule. One vegetable in the morning, two at lunch, three at dinner. I like to flip it because I like to do a green smoothie in the morning. So I just throw a bunch in there and then I'm like, okay, I'm already five in. I'm good. But, you know, I remind them like it can be a carrot in your back pocket as you're walking out the door. It doesn't, you know, it can be a handful of spinach just sort of folded into something. It doesn't have to be like an enormous salad at every meal. And we know, again, from that American Gut Project data you're also getting credit for the nuts, the spices, the herbs, all of it. I just had a funny thing. I saw a video yesterday. My cousin sent me that was a panda bear and he or she had a giant, somebody had given him a giant slice of, of, of cheddar cheese and a carrot and he, <laughs> smart, just holding the cheese and just going on the carrot. Ate the whole thing, just still hold up the cheese. Like, what do you want me to do with this? He's like, there we go. That's it right there. Like it's nature. You know, yeah. I, I love they that know. because it strikes me all the time. Well, we live right in DC near Rock Creek Park. And when my daughter was little, we'd have school trips and different trips to the zoo. And I would get to the zoo and I would literally start bawling or I would start ranting about like, oh my God, the orangutan looks so sad. Look at that poor lion. Why are we doing this? And we get, you know, it's like every week somebody tells me about their dog or cat having a new disease. That is a disease that did not exist in these animals before we domesticated them. And we started giving them our crummy food and having them sit around, you know, like we're doing the same things with our animals. Like they're sitting around you know, maybe not on screens, but not getting, running around, getting dirt, sweat, veg. We're giving them this ultra processed food and they're developing the same diseases we are. And we're kind of scratching our heads, right? Yeah. There's, they have microbiomes too. The, the microbiome affects not just our physical health, but it can affect our, I've heard you say our sleep, our mood, it can cause cancer, which of course is physical, and, and our weight. Can you go into a, some of the things that the microbiome affects that we might not think about in, uh, first, first up? Absolutely. No, I'm so glad you brought up that connection. So first of all, the gut-brain connection. If we think about a hormone like serotonin, which we think of as the feel-good hormone, we know that most of the serotonin is actually made in our gut by the gut bacteria. And of course, serotonin is a precursor hormone for melatonin, the sleep hormone. So again, we have this connection. So we have this bi-directional connection between what's going on in the brain and the gut. The brain can affect gut motility, secretion, absorption of nutrients. The gut can affect mood and um, again, feelings of anxiety, et cetera. So those two are very well connected for sure. When you think about the fact that the microbiome can influence the immune system, you start to see how autoimmune diseases like lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, Crohn's, et cetera, we have over a hundred different autoimmune diseases now. You start to see how, again, microbial disruption can be foundational to those diseases developing. We have data about heart disease, coronary artery disease, arrhythmias, all of these things being connected. Obesity is a huge one. We know that certain microbes can increase the amount of calories, what we call the energy harvest, what they pull out of food. So if you give two people with different microbiomes the exact same food, you can see more or less weight gain from the exact same meal, same calories, same macro and micronutrients based on their microbial complement. There's a famous study done from researchers at Wash U in St. Louis where they took two identical twins who were discordant for weight. So they were identical genetically, but one twin was obese and one was lean. And they took microbes from the twins and they injected them into germ-free mice. When I say injected, into the colon. Into germ-free mice who didn't have a microbiome. And without any change in diet or exercise, you know, they have the little mouse treadmill thing they have them run on in these studies. So without any changes 
the mouse who got the microbes from the obese twin started to gain weight. So we, we see that the microbiome controls a lot of these things. We know, for example, there's a bacteria called Christen senilacea, which is associated with leanness. And that tends to be one that is mostly inherited. So most of our microbiome is made through our diet, our environment, the other people in our community, our exposure to animals, etc. But Christen senilacea seems to be one of those bacteria that has a strong sort of genetic component and it's associated with leanness. So we've probably all seen those families where everybody's just a bean pole, right? And, you know, some of them eat a lot and some of them eat a little, but nobody really gains weight. It's definitely, there are some people who have a microbiome that is more associated with leanness. But here's the thing, it all comes back to, again, what they eat. So the people who have the Christian senilacea or the F. prasnitzii, they're also the ones who tend to be eating lots of plants and, you know, they're not on the sort of Cheeto cheeseburger diet. And that's why when you transport those microbes, you can see temporary weight gain or weight loss, but you can't, we can't take those microbes and put them into somebody else's body and not change your diet and expect to see meaningful weight gain or weight loss. So we always have to remember that dietary component. Yeah, there's that, that there's that 30 hour window where they'll just change right back unless you you that's right eat it with some healthy fiber. That's absolutely right. So I don't mm-hmm. like to oversell the microbiome. You know, it's not the reason my daughter's room is really messy, or you know, <laughs> or I'm not a faster runner. Like, why can't I run a sub four marathon? It's my microbiome. Um, <laughs> I wish I could just get some fast microbes. But it does, I mean, I think it's so important for people to understand that we are animated by our microbes. We are like the hive and they are the worker bees in our bodies doing all these important processes, digesting the food, synthesizing the fat soluble vitamins like A, D, E, and K, um, breaking down toxic compounds, growing new blood vessels, training the immune system, turning genes on and off. And so when that process, when our worker bees are unhealthy, either we don't have enough of them or we don't have the right ones at the right station, when that process is disrupted, it disrupts a lot of our bodily processes. And that doesn't mean there are not other things involved too, right? There are other components, there are genetic components, there are other epigenetic environmental factors that we may or may not be aware of, but it is an important foundational contribution to so many different disease states. I I wanted to look at stress and the gut. We just barely mentioned the beginning of this podcast, but millions and millions of people live with chronic or acute stress or both. Um, Most Americans are suffering from moderate to high stress. I read a uh, study that that said that 44% of Americans are reporting that their stress levels have increased over the past three years. We could guess that, but that's a really high percentage. And um, a American Psychological Association uh, survey found that the generation uh, from 18 to 33 is the country's most stressed generation, right? Like they are, it's, it's just, it's bubbling up and you're probably seeing it with your, your daughter and your daughter's generation. And there's just so much more stress than, than I feel like there used to be when I was growing up anyway. Um, and I, I want to understand the connection between the gut, stress, stress affecting immunity and even the ability to fight viruses, which is part of our immunity. Uh, I, I have a, a, a good friend who's from LA who lives in New Zealand. And, and after the pandemic, as, as, as we know, New Zealand was completely shut down for two years. She wanted to, she, she finally got a flight back to LA to visit her dad who was aging. And she wanted to make sure that she got on that flight and she did not want to test positive, you know, like the night before. So she had not gotten the, the, the virus, the COVID-19, uh, the, the whole couple of years. And so she went to the extreme of having two people, not one, but two with active COVID-19 spit in her water bottle and drink it. Uh, two weeks before she left so that if she was going to get the virus, it would move through. Uh, She didn't get it. She even then came to uh, America. She's with her husband. He got the virus and she was locked in a hotel room with him for about a week. He was very sick, didn't get it. Goes back to New Zealand, uh, goes through a incredibly stressful period of time with her business, gets COVID COVID. and is very sick and is still fighting. Uh, and that story to me is just like, 
oh my heavens, what is going on, right? What with our ability to fight or not fight, depending on the stress in our lives. I mean, it, it, it's, it's huge, we know, but that really kind of shines a light on how much stress affects really every function of our body. Yeah, that, yeah. That, that's an incredible story. And I will say, um, I think terrible idea to have somebody with COVID spit in your water bottle. Yes, yes. not it, suggesting right? that, just telling me the story. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> really. I was just picturing that. Yeah. So here's the thing. We have known for a long time, we have classic studies from Carnegie Mellon University showing that when you take volunteers at who are stressed, and this is true for sleep deprivation also, and you expose them to different form of coronavirus, this is well before COVID, um, the ones who report being stressed and or sleep deprived are much more likely to actually become sick. So one of the most important things for people to realize is that exposure does not necessarily equal infection. And your friend, Dotsy, so beautifully demonstrates that, right? And then infection does not necessarily equal debilitating illness or death, et cetera. They are degrees of that. And mm -hmm. all of these different factors go into our resilience and susceptibility, et cetera. So we've talked about a lot of them, stomach acid, gut lining, microbes, immune system. Let's talk about stress. Stress can increase levels of pathogenic bacteria a thousand fold within an hour based on those hormonal, the cortisol and the adrenaline and the noradrenaline coursing through our bodies can affect our microbiome dramatically. We talked about leaky gut earlier, increased intestinal permeability. We know that stress is a risk factor for that. It can literally increase the holes in your fishing net. There's a marvelous study from researchers at University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, where they looked at men with HIV and they found that those who reported chronic unmitigated stress. It's not the stress itself. It was, they were looking at whether these men had a mindfulness practice or something to battle the stress. And they found that people who really did not have any mechanism for handling their stress, they progressed, their HIV progressed four times faster. Wow. You think about latent viral infections like shingles. So shingles is varicella, zoster, it's a chicken pox virus, latent. And we can get these lesions, very painful lesions. Who gets shingles? People who are stressed. Who gets mono? People who are stressed. People who are sleep deprived. So sleep is our body's way of sort of re rebooting our system. And we know that T cells, in terms of being able to activate T cells and, you know, get them to work for us, for our immune system to mount an immune response, we know that sleep deprivation dramatically affects that. We know that sleep deprivation in the two days before the vaccine, and this is true for influenza, for hepatitis, and for COVID vaccines, we can see up to a 50% decrease in vaccine efficacy if you are sleep deprived in the two days before you get it. You can't mount an immune response. We know from an article in the British Medical Journal last year that chronic sleep deprivation, less than six hours a night, was associated with a whopping 88% increase in likelihood of coming down with COVID. We know in every study looking at outcome from COVID that people who report more anxiety, more stress, have worse outcomes. So this stuff isn't just in our head, it's in our bodies, it's in our immune system, it's in our gut, and it's really pervasive, and it makes us a lot more susceptible and a lot sicker. I wanted to ask um, one thing. It's a little off what we've been talking about, but you, you write about it in, in, on your blog, uh, which is about the benefits and drawbacks of chewing gum for the gut. Because a lot of people chew gum, whether they're trying to not eat or not smoke or just because they want something sweet and they don't want to eat a sweet. Uh, what, what are the, some of the benefits or drawbacks? Uh, yeah, I have that? to say, I really can't think of any benefits, Alexandra, from a gut point of view, because most of the gums that you will buy have artificial sweeteners in them. It's very difficult to find a gum that doesn't contain a non-nutritive sweetener, and those substances are really bad for our gut. The other thing that happens when you chew gum is you can swallow air inadvertently. That's a medical condition called aerophagia, air swallowing. And that can make you go up a dress size overnight. That can lead to a lot of bloating and discomfort. 
So gum, um, not something as a gastroenterologist that I highly recommend. I mean, I know it can sort of keep you busy and something to do with your mouth. Okay, every once in a while, but if you're chewing gum every day, particularly one with an artificial sweetener in it, and you're also bloated, you might want to make the connection there. Great. That's good intel. Well, folks, thank you so much, Dr. Chetkin, for all this amazing information. And people should should go get the antiviral gut, um, which is her new book, although she has also Gut Bliss, The Blow Cure, and The Microbiome Solution also, but her newest book with the Mm -hmm. latest, and as you can tell, the science is changing and we're learning so much. So this is the most up-to-date on on what we've learned. Um, Where can people find the book and, and follow you? They can find the book wherever books are sold, and you can find me on my website, two kind of tricky names to spell, robinshutkan.com, R-O-B-Y-N-N-E-C-H-U-T-K-A-N, or at Gupless on Instagram, and you can also get to my website if you look up Gupless too. Yeah, that'll all be in the show notes, folks. What a pleasure. Oh my gosh, I feel smarter. Thank you for that. Thank you so much. You guys are great. You ask fantastic questions. This is so good that you, how long have you been doing this, the podcast? We Uh, are 204 episodes in. Yeah. 204? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. And do you, how often do you record? Once a week. Once a week. Wow. Uh, So four years. Yeah, exactly. exactly. Yeah, not. I'm sorry. Now we're we're like at dots, right? Three three times a week. If we can get two guests in there, some days. Uh, luckily with you, we just have one guest today. But so we used to in the beginning, we were recording every week two guests uh, per every Tuesday. And uh, now we've gotten more relaxed. And, and we released gonna... one. So we were way ahead of ourselves is what she said, because we always just yeah. release one every week. Yeah, right. We used to be 12 episodes ahead and now we're we're two episodes ahead. <laughs> <laughs> a little more chill. Yeah, a little excellent, more chill. excellent, so, yeah. wonderful. We're really happy to promote your um... Oh, thank you so much. Hey folks. Okay. Back by very popular demand is our plant powered plate fridge magnet, which you are going to receive for free if you leave us a rating and a review on whatever platform you're listening to this podcast on. So here are the details. Just write your quick review. Does not need to be long. Does not need to be a whole story. Just be honest and speak from the heart. Then take a quick screenshot of the review you wrote and email it to us at podcast at switchforgood.org. That's podcast at switchforgood.org. And include your mailing address so we can send you a power plate. We are doing this because the more reviews we garner, the higher we go in search results, which means more folks will learn about our podcast. So the power is in your hands. Leave us a review and zoom, zoom, your power plate arrives at your doorstep. So thank you so much for tuning in today. If we helped you in any way, then click the subscribe button and let's keep hanging out together. We have so much more to share with you. And if you need more information on actually making the switch for good, please visit us at switchforgood.org for loads of info. And you can subscribe to our mailing list where you will receive all sorts of super cool gifts, discount codes to our very fave dairy-free products, and a lifetime of powerful health tips. So join us on the journey to switch for good. This is the future.